So today we're going to finish the lecturing on this chapter, all right? And then we'll have a problem set on Monday. And there's a there's a lab this afternoon, right? Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So we were um, we got into elastic waves and solids yesterday, and we're going to need this later because. Ultimately, in sonar transducers, there arise situations where you have to deal with standing waves in them, where they won't be uniformly stretched and compressed. And uh, you know, by uniform, I mean the, the strain is the same everywhere. We will talk actually more about that today in the uh, accelerometer example. So the general, this seems to always work for elastic waves. The wave speed is the square root of the elastic modulus divided by the density. But you've got to be warned here that the elastic modulus depends upon um, boundaries, if you've got boundaries in there. And I guess the classic example is compression and extension of a, of a rod. Um, oh, right. So. <coughs> The appropriate elastic modulus here, when it's stress-free around here, is Young's modulus. Right? That's how Young's modulus is defined. Now, Young's modulus is defined quasi-statically, so if we want to apply that to acoustics here, we have to have a long wavelength compared to the diameter of the rod. Things get complicated if, if you don't do that. So anyway, that's an example. The speed will be the Young's modulus divided by the density in this case. If, on the other hand, you block you don't allow expansion, you know, bulging and contraction this way, which Young's modulus allows, then you need to use the modulus of unilateral extension and compression. It's a different modulus. It's greater than Young's modulus. It's stiffer. It's going to be stiffer. If, this, if I compress this and it doesn't bulge, it'll be stiffer. The waves will travel faster. So we talked about... Um, <laughs> we're going to... The results for the different elastic wave speeds here are phrased in terms of uh, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. And you can see why, I don't think Brian stated this. I, had, I remember I had to look this up and you can see how I, how I got into this. We've got these expressions here where, um, as an example, let's look at this. Here's um, compression and ex uh, extensional waves in a bar where the wavelength is large compared to the diameter. This is what we were just talking about, right? So here is when you, in a, in a bulk medium, so you can realize that here if you don't allow any stress, if you don't allow any strain this way, or you can just have a very large, you know, very big medium, and you send a wave in it, then it'll, the motion will just be longitudinal. Here's the wave speed. So a natural issue comes up. We know that this should be, we feel physically, and we believe that this should be greater than this, right? How do you prove that? Well, it's pretty clear if you look at this, that there's, there's got to, obviously there has to be limits on Poisson's ratio, or you're going to hit a lot of trouble here. You know, this could blow up. So uh, that's where I, then I found this limitation. And if you go through and check this, we're not going to do that, but I did this once, uh, you will find for, for this restriction on the Poisson's ratio, the normal restriction, this is greater, the speed is greater than the other one, as, as expected. Uh, now, there's something actually in between the rod and the, let's just not talk about blocking the rod, which is actually a hard thing to do. Let's talk about a, a medium that has big transverse spatial extent. You send a wave in there, there's too much material here for it to bulge and contract it. The motion will be like this, and the speed will be given by that speed up there, okay? Then the other extreme is this rod here, where we have a large wavelength, and we have bulging and contracting in both perpendicular directions, right? Well, there's something in between. You can have a plate. You can imagine that you have a plate like this, and you're sending compressional waves down this plate, like this, okay? And the wavelength is large compared to this dimension, but small compared to this dimension. That can happen, 
Okay, I'm not saying it's going to happen in this class later on. I can't remember, but I, I doubt it. But it's just for completeness here, and it is interesting. So that's a different speed, and that's this speed. And where do you expect this speed to lie relative to these other two wave speeds in between? And you can confirm that, okay? And if anybody gets interested in this and you do it and you, you don't get what I'm, the answers that I'm saying, please come and see me, okay? But I'm pretty sure I remember, I think I thoroughly checked all this, but you never know, you know, I'm, it's years ago, so I don't, I'm not quite sure. But. So it makes physical sense. Now, there's another type of wave, and that's flexural waves. You studied these in 3119. And actually, one of, the, one of the reasons you study flexural waves is that they are an example of um, inherently dispersive waves. The speed depends upon the wavelength. It's not like normal sound, right? So it's good for um, people, it's good to be exposed to that. Because if you can't, you go along in acoustics and you know, you got this speed of sound that's independent of wavelength or, or frequency, eventually you're going to hit a situation where you have to deal with dispersion, where the speed depends upon wavelength. So I think that's, to me, that's one of the reasons that flexural waves are in 3119, to expose you to dis dispersive waves. Um, so that's the next one here. This, this may not look familiar to you, but in, in our, for us, in terms of Young's, Young's modulus is the restoring force here. You're, you know, you have a wave going like this. At this moment, it's, the material's being compressed down here. What's happening up here? It's being stretched. So Young's modulus is the restoring force here. And we're allowing for bulging, so it's, you know that's going to be in there. And you can see that there's a frequency dependence here. There's also this quantity k, kappa you might remember, the radius of gyration. It depends upon the cross-sectional, um, the cross-section of, of the rod. If it's, there's two standard cases, um, a circular rod, and there this so-called radius of gyration has this value, the square of it. Yeah. Um, where A is the radius of the rod. And then there's the rectang a rectangular rod like this. Right? Now, now this we drew with this being small compared to like that. You know, this dimension small compared to this dimension. But in general, you can have flexural waves along here, right? no matter what the aspect ratio is. And there the radius of gyration uh, is equal to this where h you choose to be is the dimension in the direction of the flexural oscillations. So if the wave is going like this, I'm going to choose this as h. If, on the other hand, the wave is going like this, which is much stiffer in this here, right? You send a wave this way, it could be, you know, nice, fle easily flexible. It's much stiffer this way. And in fact, you can see that in the math here. This is, um, you know, this, you're going to use this dimension here. Um, <clears throat> now we can look at so this expression is valid when the wavelength is large compared to all dimensions. This expression is. Okay, so there again, as before, there's this intermediate case. We can imagine waves going down here that, where the wavelength is large compared to this dimension, but not large compared to that dimension. And so, when the waves travel down here and both of these dimensions are small, there's going to be bulging and contracting. So if you go to a case where you're, you're eliminating the bulge and contraction one in one transverse direction, the waves are going to be stiffer. And so, I, uh, so you can verify that this, this is the speed for that intermediate case. It's analogous to the other intermediate case that we just talked about. Okay, well like I said, I'm sure we won't be using all these, but we will need some of them because we're going to have to eventually confront um, standing waves and transducers. What you're going to find in this course, one of the biggest things is that people have done incredible, they've, they've looked for transducers. They've, let's see, how do I say this? 
people have entertained just about any kind of idea you can think of for transducers because it's just so important. And different transducers have different advantages and disadvantages over other ones. So you're just going to be amazed as this, it's, it picks up towards the end of the course where there's just uh, all kinds of, of, of transducers. And so people push on it. They, they'll, they'll, uh, it's not surprising that we're going to have to deal with standing waves. This is, it's not surprising to me, and it won't be to you after you've taken this course. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do, this is a problem, but it's so important that I think we should, we're gonna do it in lecture. You know, we'll do other problems in, um, in the problem session. So this is the standard accelerometer. Here's an example of one. This is an Endevco, maybe you've heard of Endevco. They do a lot of uh, work with the military. They make all kinds of transducers. Um, this is an accelerometer, sort of a typical accelerometer. And here's, basically the idea of what's going on there. I'm going to pass this around class. Um, <clears throat> one of the things you might want to notice here is that they have this, this comes with a cable. That's kind of interesting, right? You might think, well, it's because it's micro dot. It's, uh, this is like small coaxial cable. You might think that, well, they're just being, they're just doing that so that you don't have to look around for this unusual kind of cable. And that's not really why. The reason is the cable has capacitance, right? You've got an inner conductor and outer conductor. There's going to be capacitance there. And you cannot neglect that capacitance compared to the capacitance here. So you'll see on here it says, warning, do not disconnect unless you read the manual. And it should actually have, here it is, in Devco cable model, blah, 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 capacitance, 313 picofarads. Okay? So you need to include this. And we'll actually do a problem in this later on in the course, I remember. Um, when you're dealing with this transducer, and there's, there's some electric, you know, in the front, the electrical end, on the electrical side, the capacitance, you've got to add in the capacitance of this. It's not small. And let me see if I can screw this thing back on here. <laughs> and uh, this, there's a piezo ceramic in here. We'll talk about what piezo ceramic, it's a piezoelectric material, and we'll talk about... Um, Piezo ceramics in the next chapter. Piezo ceramics, they're ceramics, which means they're brittle, so you don't want to drop this, right? Okay, all right. <clears throat> all right, so here we go. Um, here's the idea. We have, again, there's this word foundation, and what we, we want to, this is something that's vibrating, and we want to measure the acceleration. You know, you may be after velocity or displacement. But of course, once you have one, you've got the others because they're related by the frequency, okay? And it turns out this is a natural accelerometer. What this, what this transduces is acceleration. It doesn't transduce displacement. It doesn't transduce velocity. It transduces acceleration. And you're going to see why. And it's going to be similar to the geophone. Remember, the geophone is a velocity transducer because it's flat because there's a flat region in velocity. This is an accelerometer because there's a flat re region in, in acceleration. Where it's independent, the sensitivity is independent of frequency, which is very convenient. So the idea is that here's something that's moving. Uh, it's moving this way. And you want to measure that motion. Here's uh, some the transducing material, it's a piezo ceramic, okay? It has some length, script L, this way, and some width, W, this way. It's plated, electroplated on these, we'll talk a lot more about this later, here, and the wire leads are attached there. There's a loading mass here that's important that we'll talk about. And so the idea is this, is this is going up and down, the Piezo ceramic is going to be compressed and it's going to naturally be compressed and stretched here, and you're going to generate a, a varying, an oscillating voltage across there. Now, it may um, surprise you to see wait a minute, it's compressing and stretching this, this way, but we're picking up on the voltage that way. And you might think, well, that's unusual. And then you say, no, wait a minute, there's obviously a Poisson's ratio here. Well, there's more to it than Poisson's ratio, as you'll see. Okay, it's not just Poisson's ratio. Um, 
that's causing the voltage variation here. And we'll talk about that next, in the next chapter. Uh, what we're going to do now is just use the transducer equations, as, as you'll see. Uh, okay, anybody, I mean, this is the, the, anybody have any questions about this? This is the idea. Let's discuss this. The first thing we want to talk about, I think, is, oh, let me, I better follow the notes here. Um, okay, now it's going to turn out, and you'll see this in the math, we're going to do a, a pretty general derivation here that it's flat in the low frequency limit. Remember the geophone was flat in high frequency. Okay, but this is flat in the low frequency. And you'll see that. Um, and this is something that is very often, almost always happens with sensors, that they operate in um, an open circuit. So on the electrical side, there's essentially no current there. It's, be, it's going, it's, the electrical side is seeing a high, thank you, high impedance device, you know. So there's very little current. We call that open circuit. And that greatly, remember, my, we sort of, we fit this a little bit before. That greatly simplifies the analysis. Now, this loading mass here, we're going to assume that it's much greater than the mass of the ceramic. Now, in pra I was thinking about this. In practice, I don't know if this is true. All right, this thing certainly feels heavy, but um, right, you all felt it. It's, it's quite heavy, but I don't know. I, I'm not so sure that this is met in practice. And it doesn't have to be met in practice because they don't calculate the sensitivity here. I mean, they may have when they were when they designed this thing, but in the bottom in the the bottom line, it's what are they going to do? to determine the sensitivity. They're going to measure it. They're going to quote it to you, right? For us, actually going through a calculation, a rigorous calculation, we want to make this assumption. Okay, and the reason is, when the mass, when the loading mass is much greater than the ceramic mass, and we have this relative motion here, this will be like a massless spring. It'll be effectively massless if its mass is small compared to there. And that's important because it'll be uniformly expanding and contracting. It's like we talked about the rubber band, remember? If you take a rubber band and put the three, put dots along it, and you stretch it, all the equally spaced dots, right, in equilibrium, and then I stretch it, and it's gonna be, I'm doing this quasi-statically, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be uniform extension here. What, how, what's, what's the relative distance between the dots? They, they remain equally spaced, okay? That's uniform um, expansion. The same thing will happen here. And that's important because otherwise you're going to get standing waves there. And extreme, and then we got to deal with standing waves, which it, it eventually we'll have to, but that's complicated. An extreme case is if you imagine there's no mass here. So I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but what if you have a spring that's anchored here. So it's the situation is, I guess I can use this. You have a spring here, and it's in a gravitational field, but don't, don't worry about that. And you start, this spring's gonna have different standing wave modes. You know, it's, it's, like a, it's like a string. It's just a different situation than you've probably seen before. You got a fixed boundary condition here. What's the boundary condition here? What's the strain of the spring have to be right at the end here? What does it see? Nothing. Zero strain at the end. That's the boundary condition. There will be strain here. So the strain is obviously not uniform. Even in the lowest mode here, where it's just going, it's going down and coming up, there's no, uh, you know, the lowest frequency mode here will not be a uniform compression and extension mode. And you know it won't be because there's going to be very little strain here and there's going to be, you know, a bigger strain there. So it'll be a kind of quarter wavelength kind of thing. So to, in order to do all the calculations, we want this to be uniform, so we put a loaded mass. We put a, a mass there that's much greater than the ceramic mass. Okay. <coughs> Um, so, in our theory, we're going to make the assumption that we have uniform 
extension and compression of the of the of the ceramic. We're going to make that assumption. That's going. But in reality, if you go to a high enough frequency, you're going to start to see standing wedge in there. Our theory will break down there. So we're going to need, here's something that you know very well. This is going to be the resonant frequency. We neglect the mass of the ceramic. Remember, this is the compliance, which is 1 over the stiffness. And you know that the, this is a mass on a spring, essentially. So the resonant frequency here, the mechanical resonant frequency is going to be given by this expression. That's going to be an important quantity. Um, we need to know the stiffness here. And it's better to deal with the compliance. So that's just 1 over the stiffness. And it's given by this. Now, that looks a little complicated. And this is maybe, I think, the first time you've seen it. I can't remember. We're going to see it a number of times in this class. Here's what's happening here. Oh, I, I realize there's a really good analogy. Let me give you, I just, I realized this last night. Take some material that has, uh, this is resistivity. Electrical resistivity. It's not density, okay? And it's got some cross-sectional area A, some length L. What's the resistance across here? This is going to have some electrical resistance. This is like elementary, this is like 1322 kind of stuff. It's elementary electromagnetism. Well, this is the, the resistance, you can think of it as, as resistance per unit volume. This is the resistance, inherent resistance of the material. We now have to take into account the geometry. Okay, so it's clear that the resistance is going to be proportional to resistivity. No question. This is uniform. It's, it's got to be. Now, how do we get the geometry in there? How, how is it going to depend upon, if I double the length, if I have two resistors and I put them together, what happens? I double the resistance, okay? The resistance here is going to be proportional to the length, okay? And how is it going to depend upon the area? Well, that's like resistors in parallel. If I double the area, it's like adding another resistor here. It's going to be inversely proportional to there. So this is a simple formula that people use in introductory physics. Okay, if you if you if you had that recently, I don't know. Well, I guess we talked about that in the first day of class, but um, we don't need to talk about it anymore. Anyway, we have an, we have a similar situation here. Here's the compliance. Well, it's, maybe it's better to think of one over this, 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 the stiffness. The stiffness of this macroscopic piece of material is going to depend upon the material stiffness. That would be, you know, in this thinking of stiffness, that would be C instead of S here. And then it's going to be um, inversely, it happens to be inversely proportional to the length here. Right? The longer you make it, the, the easier it is to compress it. And the wider, the greater the cross-sectional area, the harder, the stiffer it is. So it's a very similar kind of thing. And you can see there's the cross-sectional area, there's the length. Now this is 1 over the stiffness. Okay? So we get this. So here are the piezoelectric relationships that we talked about yesterday. Right? They're written in the uh, in component form here. Um, and this is treating stress and electric field as the independent variables and strain and displacement field as dependent variables. <clears throat> and that'll work fine for us here. Now, what kind of stress do we have? The reason this is pretty, it's good, nice to have stress here is do we, we just have stress this way. There's no stress. And we're going to call that the um, is it the three direction? I think it's the three direction. Usually, no, it's wrong. One, oh. So, sorry. We're going to have the stress is only in the one direction. This is stress free on the sidewalls here. Okay, so we only have a T1. Okay. Now, furthermore, what's the displacement field? The displacement field is dictated by the free charge. Remember that? The free current and the free charge. What current do we have here? Zero. Yeah, zero. There's no free charge. 
So, uh, because we have negligible current. So that's a really nice simplification. All these d's are zero, in particular d3 is zero, and that's what's going to that's going to give us useful information. In fact, the only information we need from here is in the three direction here. This is in the electrical direction across the the plates, right? The terminals or the electrodes, whatever you want to call them. We've got this equal to zero. We only have a T1, okay? And we're analyzing this for M is equal to three here. We're setting M is equal to three. So we get this. Now, what, what do we have here? Well, it turns out, and I'll explain this to you in the next chapter, that for piezoceramics, the dielectric constant is diagonal. They're not all the same, as you'll see, but there, there are no off-diagonal elements for piezo ceramics due to the way that they're made. And I'll explain this to you in the next chapter. So we only pick up, because it's diagonal here, we just pick up the epsilon 3, 3 term. So we get this from this equation, looking at m in the 3 direction. Um, and now, this is something we'll do again and again. What we're interested in is voltage here. We don't have voltage here, we have the electric field. But assuming a parallel plate type geometry, the electric field times the distance is the voltage. We've talked about that before, I think, right? So there you see it. We'll do this again and again. Uh, it's assuming a uniform field, which is a standard assumption, even when it's not such a good approximation. But it's, you know, otherwise it becomes you probably have to put this on a computer, okay? We can't be really hard to do analytical work. Um, there are some exceptions that we'll hit, but not many exceptions. So the voltage is the electric field times the thickness. All right, and you can see here that we can express the voltage in terms of the stress. So the voltage is proportional to the stress. This T1 is the, the stress in the material, of course, okay, the, the transducing material. Now, we're after the sensitivity here, which for us is going to be, and you'll see why after we go through this, it's going to be the volts divided by the acceleration. So we have the voltage here, it's proportional to stress. The, it, the acceleration is also going to be proportional to the stress. So what we need to do now is find the acceleration in terms of the stress. When we take the ratio, it will cancel and we'll have our sensitivity. That's the idea. So as I said before, the mass is effectively, um, the ceramic is effectively massless because we imagine a heavy loading mass. We have this uniform um, strain of, of the transducing material. <clears throat> now because it's effectively massless, there can be no force on it. So there are two forces on the ceramic. There's the force of the foundation and the force of the loading mass. Those two forces have to cancel in our approximation because it has very little mass. And so what can we write down here? F, remember now, this is canonical transduction. F has a specific meaning. In this case, it's going to be the force of the foundation on the ceramic. All right? That's what the meaning of F is. And if you think back, you know, this was from the first week. If you look at the transduction, these are the general transduction equations. That's the meaning. Well, the, hmm. Well, this is the analogous to our transduction equations. But we'll see in a moment the equivalent circuit here. This is, an, this is the ex, this F here, is the external force. So we need to be a little careful here. I don't know if it ever makes any difference, but it's just good to be careful here. We need to relate the force to the stress in the ceramic, and there's a minus sign there. Now you know, that, you, know you have to have this Y. Remember, stress is force per unit area. So to, get, so to get the force, we've got to multiply by the area. So that's why the WT is there, the width times the thickness. That's got to be there. But why is the minus sign there? Well, the reason is, we have this ceramic. When there's, po this is positive strain, okay? And positive strain is defined to correspond to positive stress. Pretty obvious, okay? So if I've got this, things, let me, better go to the diagram here. 
And we're going to, um, I'm going to belabor this just a little bit because it's, it's going to come up in the future again, this kind of thing here. When this is stretched, the strain T1 is going to be positive, right? Well, it's exerting, what, what's the direction of the force that it's exerting on the foundation? Well, it's this way, right? What's the direction that the foundation is exerting on the mass? It's the opposite way. You have to have net force on this interface right here because it's massless, this little plane right here. So that's why we got to put a minus sign there. F, this is the positive direction of F, but when there's positive st stress, F will actually be pointing this way and it'll be negative and vice versa. So that's why we got the minus sign there. Like I said, I'm, I, I'm not sure if it ever makes any difference, but you just got to be careful because when you get to more complicated transducers, you might be able to get away with dropping a sign in a simple transducer, okay? It may just make a difference in the phase, which usually we don't care about, 180 degrees different phase. But for more complicated transducers, perhaps with more ports, a sign difference can be, can be important. It can change the whole, change everything. So that's why we gotta have this here. And in the end, in the end what we find, oh, so anyway, we have to have this. Now, I'll, you can read this if you're interested, but because we have a mass, there can be no net force on the, um, on the ceramic, right? And because of that, we have shown before that it simply just transmits the force. So here's the argument in this case why it transmits the force. But the bottom line, and you should feel comfortable with this because we've talked about it before, is F, which is the force of the foundation on here, is going to be the same as the force of this on that. Because this is massless, it just transmits the force. Remember that? Okay. So I go through so a little argument of that there. You can look at it if you're interested. All right. So finally, we can write down this force here, which is the force of the foundation on the ceramic. We know it's equal to this. It just gets transmitted. It's the mass times the, the loading mass times the acceleration of that mass. Now, <clears throat> we're ultimately going to be only interested in the low frequency limit here. And, and you'll see why. Um, <clears throat> and that limit, I'm doing this like this, slow, these things are going to just track each other there'll be negligible stretching and compressing of the ceramic in the low frequency limit. And we'll verify that. So we'll have this. So we could at this point, if all we're interested in is the low frequency sensitivity, we can, we, we gotta get rid of this. We've gotta connect this to the acceleration of the foundation, right? This is just in there. This mass is there for our, for our convenience. So we need to get rid of this A sub M. And it's trivial in the low frequency limit. However, it's much more interesting to not make this assumption, the low frequency assumption, until later. So we're going to do a general derivation here for all frequencies except very high frequencies. At very high frequencies, our theory will break down because you'll start to get, you'll get standing waves here. And that'll happen with any spring, incidentally. If you go to high enough frequency, you're going to start to see massive, you're going to see standing waves in there. <coughs> So other than that, though, which is going to be a very high frequency, our theory is going to be accurate. And then we'll take the general theory and specialize to the low frequency case. So here's our system. Here's what we need to solve. We need to, um, well, we're kind of going in reverse here. We have a relationship for this, but we, we need to get at that. So <clears throat> the question is, you know, given this acceleration, What's that going to cause here? So I got this situation where this is going like this, and this is going, well, it's going to be going at the same frequency, but there can be a phase difference, right? And an, ampli and an amplitude, you know, an acceleration difference in amplitude and phase. So we basically need to get rid of this in here and connect it up with that, because that's what we're after. We want to measure that. <clears throat> what does the equivalent circuit look like? So, how many velocities do we have here? Two. We got the velocity here, a velocity here. The velocity corresponds to a current. So I'm going to call one velocity u sub m. That's going to be the current through the inductor here. 
u we is of course going to be the velocity here. The spring is sensitive to the difference of the velocities. Okay, if the two velocities are the same, the spring isn't doing anything. There's no current through the capacitor. So this, so the Cortland circuit has to be this. There's no question about it. It's got to be this. <coughs> So we're going to first do a Newtonian approach. I told you a couple, ooh, I told you some weeks ago that I, I make it a point in this class to do problems both ways in some cases, mechanically and electrically. And it's, it's just almost always easier, especially in transduction, to do it electrically. Kirchhoff's laws are much easier to deal with than Newton's laws. So we're going to do that here, too. This is one more case where we're going to do both. Let's do the mechanical one first. So what's the force on the mass? Well, I, I get that from Hooke's law. It's going to be the distance the spring is stretched <coughs> times the spring constant, which is 1 over the compliance. The distance the spring is stretched is the difference in the x-coordinates here. There's going to be an x-coordinate here, a displacement here, and a displacement here. I've got to take the difference. And now the final thing is the sign. Which way does the sign go? Well, so here's how I do it. Suppose xm is greater than x. So we have a situation here where this is moved over here, but this is moved farther. Which way is the force on the spring? Which, which <laughs> direction is the force of the spring on the mass? this way. So that's why I got the minus sign there. And if you're really paranoid, you can do it the other way too. But once you do it this way, it's going to hold for all possible, you know, both possibilities, <coughs> whether this is plus or minus. <coughs> By Newton's second law, that has to equal the mass times the acceleration of the loaded mass, the mass of the loaded mass times the acceleration of it. And because this is all steady state here, the acceleration is going to be minus x squared times the displacement. Okay, usual e to the i omega t. <coughs> and now, the reason I put the x in there is now we got one unknown here. If you look at this, this has to equal this. We can solve for xm. And that's easy to do. And this is what you get. So that's the displacement of the loading mass compared to the displacement of the foundation. <coughs> and this we need. We're doing this because we got to get rid of this. What we care about is that. But our stress relationship involves, involves that. Um, so right away we should uh, get rid of, we shouldn't carry this around anymore. We should convert to the relevant physical quantity, which is the resonant frequency, omega naught squared. Okay, so we get that. Now that we've got the displacement, what we really need is the acceleration, but that's easy, isn't it? The acceleration is going to be minus omega squared. The acceleration here and here is just going to be minus omega squared times that. So this relationship carries over to here. Okay, and for velocity too, if you need that. <coughs> okay, so we've found the acceleration. Now before we go on, I want to point something out here. What happens in the quasi-static limit, in the low, in other words, the low frequency limit? What do we get? We get that they're equal, and that's what we were just saying before. If this thing's moving back and forth, you know, slowly, whichever way it's moving here, <coughs> they're just going to track. You're going to get negligible change in distance there. So that's a check, okay, on our solution. Um, now, so we could now, before proceeding, we're going to take this and substitute it in our stress equation. Before doing that, let's do the Kirchhoff's. You can see we had to think here, right? We had to think about the sign, you know. And <laughs> but look at the equivalent circuit. This is really simple. The same, this, we think of this as a voltage. The same voltage occurs across here as it does across here, right? So I'm going to use impedance to analyze this. And here it is. We have the same voltage across the capacitor. The voltage is the impedance times the current. What's the current? Well, it's the difference of the velocities, right, from the equivalent circuit. The impedance is 1 over I omega C. We also we have the same voltage across the inductor. What's the impedance of an inductor? I omega M. The current is UM. So we write this down. We solve for UM. We get that. And now you can, if you replace both of these U's, you can replace them with X or A, as we just said. So we immediately get the answer. 
So this is one other example where it's much easier to use Kirchhoff's laws, <coughs> which is typically the case. Once a problem gets to be a little complicated, and transducer problems you know, are very seldom simple. I, you probably can, you know that by now, I think. <laughs> so um, it's just much easier, and you're less likely to make a mistake using Kirchhoff's law. Of course, you've got to get the equivalent circuit right, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, now we can proceed. Remember we had this before. The force of the foundation in terms of the stress <coughs> is equal to this. Now we can get rid of this AM. We substitute our expression for the acceleration. And now we can solve for the acceleration in terms of T1. And now we're essentially done. Because the open circuit sensitivity, remember this is not a zero, it's an O. It stands for open. The open circuit sensitivity here, treating the transducer as an accelerometer, is the volts per meters per second squared, okay? The volt uh, potential difference divided by the acceleration. So we form that ratio, T1 cancels out because we have a linear system, and there's our open circuit sensitivity. In general, as long as you don't have stand, the only assumption here is that we don't have standing waves in the this, in this ceramic. So it's valid up to frequencies, you know, when, when that starts to happen, you get standing waves, then it's going to start to break down. We have, uh, you know there's going to be a resonance here, when omega is equal to omega naught, and here it blows up, so here's m is equal to 1, I've done this in all dimensional units, I've just set this equal to 1 in the plot, it's not important. So I'm basically just plotting, plotting this, and for m is equal to 1 here, we get, uh, you know, this divergence at when the dimensionless frequency is equal to one, when omega is equal to omega naught, so we get infinite. Um, if the infinity bothers you, you just put in a little damping. That's going to make it finite, right? We don't need to worry about that. <coughs> and here is, for what we're going to mention in a few minutes, here's a different value of m, a greater value of m. You see the sensitivity is proportional to m, okay? So this is 5 instead of 1, and you'll see down here it's, it's 5 times. So this is what it looks like, and we'll talk about this in a moment. <coughs> now, why is it called an accelerometer? Because this is the sensitivity for, for treating it like an accelerometer. And the reason we treat it like we think of it as an accelerometer is because it's flat right here. Really, because it's flat. So the operating region, when you look, some, you know, look up a sensitivity on here, there's a, there's a sensitivity here, it's going, to be, it's going to be down here at sufficiently low frequency. <coughs> and if you're concerned about this, there'll be additional information that's written on the front here. It'll tell you, you know, how high you can go before you start to get out of the flat region. It'll tell you the resonant frequency. I think they'll probably give you that information. Um, okay. Now, yes. It, it looks like it like asymptotes to like zero near the end, but is that just because this theory doesn't consider high frequencies? Right. Yeah. Now, this where this starts to break down, you know, I I don't know. It's going to depend upon material constants, but I think typically it's going to be way out here. Is, is my guess. We can we can at least imagine that. So this, yeah, this is, again, uniform compression and extension. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, getting back to the original question here. Now that we see that this is flat and we want to treat it like an accelerometer, what is the sensitivity? Well, it's really easy to get from our expression here. We look in the low frequency limit and it's just going to be this. So the low frequency sensitivity is a constant, as you can see from the graph, and analytically it's given by this expression. Um, there's some addition, something else I want to say here. Oh, I, okay, in case I, it's not in the notes. The geophone had a completely different operating principle. It was, um, you know, operating principle, you know what that is, right? It's, um, what basic physics principle is operating there to get the transduction? That was a moving coil in a magnetic field. This is piezoelectric, very completely different. 
Okay? And it turns out that the geophone is, you know, it's a velocity. It's flat in velocity. And it's in the high frequency limit. Right? So it's just different, you know, this is, can happen, right? There's no general rule here. Um, <coughs> Now, I'm gonna, you can read this, I'm going to skip this. Um, what's the, let's do what we did with the geophone. What's the velocity sensitivity? That's the volts per meter per second, right? Well, I, can, I know V over A, and I know A and U are related by just a factor of I omega, right? So you can see here that Now, I want you to think of this as the exact one, the, one, not the, the previous one, okay, that goes up to higher frequency, the, the resonance. It's, nowhere, it's not going to be flat anywhere for velocity. So velocity is not a good variable here. You can also look at the displacement, and it is, um, when you look at the displacement, and again, you don't want to, you know, don't substitute this, substitute the, the more exact expression in here. You'll find that the displacement is flat at high frequency. So we can think of this as a displacement meter at high frequencies. It's flat. But what's going to happen at high frequency? We run into the standing wave problem. So that's, yeah, so I think that's why it's, it's nailed down to being an accelerometer. Uh, okay, now. So, one of the reasons you're taking this course is, <laughs> and is that if you didn't, or if it, like me before I started teaching this, okay, you look this, you look this up, and you, you, know, you see it, and you go, okay, you don't know what's behind it, because you haven't taken the course, you know, and I've never really thought about it, and you say, suppose you're in a situation where you need greater sensitivity. You know, this can happen in a research environment. You know, sometimes you have to modify your off-the-shelf transducers, or worse, you have to make your own. I've talked to you about this before. So suppose you, you need whatever you, the transducer you're dealing with, you need to make it more sensitive. You would look at this and you would say, oh, I just, I'm going to increase the, the loading mass. And that's true. It will increase the, it's the, sensitive, the low frequency sensitivity is proportional to the loading mass. But there's a problem is if you keep increasing the mass, and what is it? The problem, you can see it in the graph here. Suppose you're interested in operating you know, around here. What's, what's happening as you keep increasing M? You're going to get out of the flat regime because the resonant frequency is dropping down. The flat regime is shrinking. That expression is only valid in the low frequency limit. And what we mean by low frequency, for M is equal to 1, we think of this as low frequency. Right? For M is equal to 5, I, it's, this is not low frequency anymore, is it? Because the resonant frequency, so it's, it's not sufficiently low compared, the resonant frequencies come down. So now the flat regime is over here. Instead, I did a little trick here. You'll notice I went logarithmic on here. Can you imagine why I did that? I can't remember, but I can imagine why I did it. Can you imagine? This looks so much more impressive to get the flat region here, right? Because I'm going, I'm expanding the smaller. If you do it on a linear scale, it's, it just didn't look that impressive. So I fixed that. <laughs> so a nice flat region. Um, <clears throat> this mass, so, you know, you need to know what's behind this. You've lost information here. And what you, know, what you don't know can hurt you. So you just can't keep increasing this mass. You're going to hit trouble. There is something interesting here, pursuing this mass, this increasing the mass thing. It's a little surprising. Let me make sure I'm not missing something here. Okay. Suppose you don't, you're not, uh, you don't, you're not worried about this, and you just keep increasing the mass. Eventually, your the resonance will be, you're, you're at where you're interested. The frequencies you're interested in are going to be above the resonant frequency. So now you're going to be effectively over here, right? It's not flat, but something interesting happens, and you can see it in the graph here. I didn't see it when I first plotted this. I was just playing around with the formulas, with our, with our formula here. With this formula, oops. I was playing around with this. What happens when you're well above the resonant frequency? You can kill this. What's omega naught squared? It's proportional to what? 
It's, uh oh. Oh, this is 1 over omega naught squared. Omega naught squared is inversely proportional to the mass. So what happens to the mass here at a high frequency? It cancels out. So, not only, this is something else that's happening here. When you, when you imagine that you're, you, you, say, you say you're going to just increase the mass to get the sensitivity, if you just keep increasing it, eventually the sensitivity becomes independent of the mass. When you're over on the other side of the resonance here, where these curves, this is coming in here, you, you have a sensitivity here, of course, but it becomes independent of the mass. And you can see that in the math. It's very easy to see it. And I comment on it. Um, here I'm commenting in the, in, line, in the text here. Um, OK, so we. we I belabored this, we beat on it, but it's, a, it's one of those, it's like the geophone, you know, it's an important case. And it's our first case with piezoelectric material. Where we, so that's why we fully analyze. And there's a lot, a lot going on here, you can see. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so um, lab at three. Good.